All right, so there in Ruth chapter 1, a verse that really sticks out to me in this is, is verse 18. Look where it says, When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And I think that verse can sort of summarize this first chapter here as we as everything lays out, that she had it in her mind steadfastly that she was going to go. Now let's let's look, let's take it in context. Look at verse number one here. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And certain men of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now the Moabites, for those that don't know, of course, Moab came from the daughters of Lot. If you remember the story in Genesis 19 where he had two daughters that got him drunk, both lay with him, incest in the Bible. Hey, you know, there's the warning of what happens when you grow up around sodomites. There's another warning what happens when you allow alcohol in your house. It perverts the mind. Um, but in Genesis 19, it says that the younger daughter lay with him, the older daughter lay with him. And they were the, 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 the mothers of Ammon and Moab. So the nation of Ammon and the nation of the Moabites came from this, this cursed thing. And a lot of the people that grew up, they were cursed because they left off from serving God. They didn't obey God. So the Moabites were known as, as cursed people in a certain sense. And, but yet here there was this famine. So we have an Israelite who says, hey, we're going to go into a cursed nation. We're going to go somewhere we should. We're going to cross over the river. We're going to go over to where you know there is no famine. Look at verse 2. In the name of the man was Elimelech, in the name of his wife, Naomi, in the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. <coughs> so again, Elimelech moves his family to Moab to this pagan country to flee the famine. And it's not uncommon these days for someone to move for a job. Yeah. We see it all the time. In fact, you know, we would probably all move for the right job or the right money. You know what I mean? That we probably all have a price, whatever that money would be, where you would actually move for a great job. But what about a spiritual move? Yeah. How many of us would be willing to pick up and go for spiritual reasons? Consider that. Look at verse 3. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Right? So what's the price of pursuing money a lot of times. It's your own life. There's a lot of people that get to the end of their life and they have this sense that they have not accomplished anything. Throughout life, they have the wrong goals, the wrong focus. When it's money, when financial gain is your focus in life, you will end your life feeling sad and sorry as if you had accomplished nothing. It's all going to be eaten up. It's all going to be spent. I don't care how rich you are, how poor you are. You can't take it with you. You'll never be satisfied when your goal is money. And sometimes it will actually cost you your life. Look at verse 4. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Right? So even after the husband dies, Instead of moving back, instead of saying, whoa, you know, God's cursing my family, they stayed. They stayed another 10 years. And they, you know, they took wives of these pagan women. And, you know, again, what's the price of, of serving? Sometimes, hey, maybe it's your children, you know, we, as we look next. But I want to comment on something here real quick. Ruth 1.4 where he says, the name of the one was Orpah. Now, for those of you that don't know, Oprah Winfrey was born with the name Orpah. That was her birth name. It was Orpah. She was given a, a Bible name. Now, it's not one of the better Bible names as you read in context that she goes back to her gods. She stays in Moab for the pagan gods. And you know, that is actually fitting because Oprah Winfrey is a daughter of the devil. Yeah, right. She is a wicked person. Yeah, right. She has every false prophet in America. She prances them across the stage. She wants, to, wants you to know who the new Freemasonic priests are. She wants you to know who the new popular preachers of America are because they preach that same gospel which is Antichrist. It's, it's not Jesus only. And like I said, she is, she's a Masonic witch. The curse of God is on her life. And you know, would you seek wisdom at her mouth? But Americans do. A lot of people look to Oprah and they look to her for wisdom. What a foolish thing to look to a, a daughter of the devil for wisdom. Do you want that curse on your life? You know, it, it, she reminds me of Jezebel in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Oprah, 
Jezebel Winfrey. She's <laughs> wicked as hell. She's putting all the false prophets up. She's putting the men of God down, right? She is allowing wickedness to prosper through the power that's been given to her through the media, which is nothing more than the devil. That's the devil's influence on America, and it's hurting our country, the fact that they're lifting this woman up. But you know what? Jezebel had a fate where the dogs ate her and her corpse laid in the street. There was nothing left but her skull and her feet. Hey, maybe Oprah will have that same fate because she is wicked as hell. That's right. And, you know, Oprah, it's fitting, you know? She was the, the name of somebody that went back to serve the wrong gods. All right, look at Ruth verse 5 here. He says, And Malon and Chilion died also both of them, and the woman was left, her two sons and her husband. So again, the price of pursuing money, sometimes it's not just your own life, sometimes it's your family. right? I wonder if Elimelech had known that it would have cost not only his life, but let alone his son's life. I imagine if he was leaving, and they said, whoa, 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 stay in the land where there's famine, and you won't lose your sons, he probably would have stayed. right? I know I would. Wouldn't you hate to lose your children just because you're searching for a better job? And that's what happens in America. When you search for prosperity, sometimes you end up gaining Worldly children that follow the ways of the world, the wisdom of the world, and they don't know God. And that's sad. I mean, here they, di they died physically, but there's a spiritual application. Look at verse 6. It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited His people in giving them bread. So now she says, Oh, wait, the famine's over. I'm going to go back to God. I've already been cursed of God. Things are going terrible. i got to get out of here. Else, She's probably thinking, else I would die. right? Else God's going to strike me dead. So she begins to leave. The daughter-in-laws follow. And look, it says, when she went forth out of her place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with, with the dead and with me. So she blesses them. Thank you for staying with me, but you better go. I need to go back to my country. Why don't you go back to Mama's house? Maybe there's something there for you, right? Maybe Mama will take care of you. And, you know, Naomi has this feeling that she needs to go. She needs to return to God and her people. She's in a strange land. They've been there for a decade and nothing good has happened that she can perceive, right? Look at verse 9. The Lord grant you that ye find that ye may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. And she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. So she's even trying to say, you know, go back to where maybe you'll get a husband. Go to mama's house. Maybe you'll find your own husband. Look at verse eleven. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Of course, the tra tradition back then was if, if a, a husband dies, you would marry his brother. And there were certain you know, uh, ordinances for that, certain opportunities for that, to where you're still in the family, you would raise up seed. And so that's what she's referring to. Look at verse 12. She says, Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, She's saying, hey, look, even if I got married tonight, how long is it going to take to raise a son that's old enough to marry you? She's trying to appeal to their logic. She's really trying to appeal to their flesh also. Don't follow me. Wouldn't you rather have a husband? You know, I'm old. You're younger. Maybe there's hope. Go get a husband, right? Go back. Why would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. She's making this point. Like, look, you lost your husband. I've lost my sons. I've lost my husband. God's hand is against my family because we went searching for money. We went against the Lord. And now the Lord is punishing us. And you know, in a way, this reminds me of Jonah. You guys remember in Jonah how everything that happened on the boat and then those sailors actually start saying, whoa, they're seeing that this guy's being chastised of the Lord. They had heard of the Lord. So they actually swear to the Lord, make vows unto Him, make a sacrifice. I mean, those men in the boat probably got saved because they saw a man of God being corrected by God. And consider this, Christian. When you get corrected of God, 
Sometimes it's not just for you to learn a lesson. Maybe sometimes it's also for those that are unsaved to see the witness that God corrects those that He loves. Hey, maybe there are... And you know this, when there's kids that are raised that don't get attention, they act out just to get attention, right? And the unsaved, if they see you corrected because, hey, you know what? I messed up. I was wrong. I went against God's will and now He's correcting me and you just take it like you ought to. Take your lumps, right? Yeah. Then maybe some of the unsaved will say, wow, I want a God like that. Right. I want a God that loves me enough to, to correct me and tell me what's right and what's wrong. Right. Consider that. And you know, as, just as in Jonah, I think the same thing here. She's making a testimony to them. I'm sorry for your sakes. I've hurt you because I was disobedient. Right? Her family sinned and now these two ladies, these Moabites, they had to suffer. They lost their husbands. And look what he said. Look at verse 14. And they lifted up their voices, their voice, and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother. So kissed her mother. She said, okay, I'm out of here. See you later. I'm, I'm done. Bye. Right? But Ruth clave unto her. Right? Ruth is cleaving to the godly woman. She's saying, hey, I see what's going on. I know who your God is. I'm holding on to you. I'm going with you. Look. And she said, behold, Thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. She, so Ruth is saying, I'm not going back to those people. I'm not going back to those gods. I want to go with you. I know that the, that the hand of the Lord is with you. Even when He's correcting you, it's evident that God is with you. Look, she says in verse 16, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. I believe that, that Ruth is searching for salvation. I believe that she is looking for the God that created everything. She knows, she's heard of the God that's in Jerusalem, right? She's heard of the God that's in Judah. How He's the one true living God. She's probably heard of salvation. She's heard of the history. And she's saying, hey, I don't want a husband. I want salvation. I'd rather search after spiritual things than physical things. And listen, we know the end of the story here. She gets a physical blessing. She gets a husband. But it started out when she said, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about a husband. I'm going to worry about God first. right? I'm going to seek His kingdom first and trust Him to provide everything I need. I'm going to cleave to Naomi and her God and let God provide what I need. You know, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And personally, I had this same problem in life. I thought, well, once I get everything in order, then I'll go serve God. And it wasn't until I said, you know what? I'm going to go serve God and I'm going to trust Him to fill in everything that I lack. I'm going to trust Him to provide everything that I need and I'm willing to sacrifice everything to follow God. That's when God really started blessing me in life. In Hebrews 11 it says, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. Right? If you don't believe that God exists, if you don't believe on God, you can't be saved. It says, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You have to believe that God's real and He'll reward that. You have to believe that He will reward you for seeking you and He will reward you. That's His promise. I believe she wanted to be saved. She had faith and she moved. She did something about it. She heard of their God. She knew of His power and His might. Maybe she saw the curse on Naomi and, des and despite the curse, she said, I want to serve God. Yeah. I want to be with the one true Lord. She wanted God's blessing. She was willing to leave her people, their false gods and her land to get a blessing from God. Look at verse 17. She says, Where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me. Now when she says that, she's talking about death. She's saying, God kill me. She's saying, the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Now she's using the Lord's name. She is not doing it in vain. She's actually swearing by the name of the Lord, showing that she trusts in His name, right? She is using God's name in a good way, saying, hey, God do so unto me if I don't follow you and stay with you. Yeah. Now look, look, she's not, she's not cussing, she's swearing. There's a difference. In, in Deuteronomy 10, he says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him shalt thou serve, and to Him shalt thou cleave and swear by His name. 
Now, we don't use God's name as a swear word. That's cussing. Yeah. But we swear by God's name. All right? I swear, if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. That is a right. promise. I'm not taking anything above measure. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Right? This yeah. is a promise that God has said. I swear, if I leave this church, if I step out of the will of God, and I go live for the world, God should smite me. God should kill me for leaving what He's given me. And that's basically what she's saying. She's saying, no, I'm going with you. I'm going to find your God. I want salvation. And I, I, I'll even put my life on the line. God should do so and more to me if I leave this blessing you've given to me. And think about how bold she is with this. Do you fear God enough to swear by His name? Even to the point of putting your life on the line? Would you swear an oath to God? Lord, if I ever drop out of church, would you just give me a heart attack? Would you just give me cancer and eat me up and call? I don't want to be one of these rotten, worthless, deadbeat Christians. I want to do something for you, and I want to stay in fire for you. And I know sometimes church is boring and life is a roller coaster, but we as Christians need to take a stand and be willing to trust in God during the rough times, during the easy times or in the hard times. We have to balance it out. Look at verse 18. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. She's saying once she realized that she was dead set, there was no change in her, she stopped, She left off speaking. She's okay, I'm not going to convince you anymore. And she's saying, go, go, go. And she's like, whoa, no. She has already determined. Are you steadfastly minded to go get in God's will? Think about it. There are people that are not steadfastly minded. They'll watch. They'll hear. They'll hear but not doers, right? They're not out soul winning. They need to make a determination that they will be steadfastly minded to go get in God's will. Yeah. Now listen, if you're in this church, I believe that's half the battle's over, right? You're already here. But don't stop now, right? Don't just say, well, I'm here, I'm in church. You need to be steadfastly minded to grow. You need to say, I need to, if I have to burn the candle at both ends, I got to figure this thing out. Yeah. I got to grow spiritually. I got to understand God's word. I got to become a soul winner. Amen. Would you be willing to move and lose everything, give up everything to be used mightily of God? That's a big question. And I know some of you already have. I know I have a couple times now. And that was a hard decision. Turn to Genesis 45. Genesis chapter 45. When my family realized that I was steadfastly minded to go to Fort Worth, they, you know, they quit speaking. They left off speaking with me, right? They said, oh, okay, I can't convince you. He's going to go. He's going to Fort Worth. Nothing will stop it. When my friends realized that they couldn't convince me to stay in Moab, right? They, okay, they blessed me and, okay, we'll go. You go and do what you need to do, right? They finally gave up. But it took me showing my determination, hey, I'm going to go. I'm steadfastly minded. I'm standing fast. I'm standing firm. I know this is the right decision. I'm moving forward and I'm not looking back. And that's the attitude we have to have for our spiritual growth yeah. as an individual, as a family. But also there are other people in our sphere of influence that we need to remind them they need to go. Right? Maybe they're not in church. Maybe they're too far away. Maybe they're in a church that just does, that thinks that the Great Commission is a joke. They need to get out of that church and go somewhere that's obeying God's commandment. They need to take it seriously. In the same way, you know, to be used greatly of God as she was, or as she will be as we see in this story, we have to take that same attitude and be willing to go. Be willing to make a plan and stick with it. And there are people, just this past weekend or two, we met people that said, I want to move to your church. I'm ready to move to Jacksonville. I want to be part of your church. Well, well those people need to set a date, make a plan, and stick to it. They need to be steadfastly minded to go. Because if you're not willing to move for God, well then you'll never grow for God. How could you be used of God? In the same way when I said, well you know what, I want to one day be a pastor, Lord willing, right? If I never left Florida to begin with to go to Texas, then I would have never been sent back from Texas to Florida, right? And I had to be willing to say, I'll forsake all, and go to Texas. And I'll forsake all and go to Florida. And, you know, and wherever God wants to send me, He'll send me. But I believe this is where He wants me to live and breathe and die and serve Him. And now that I'm here, I have to be steadfast in my mind to grow. To grow spiritually. To, to help you guys grow. This is our goal. When my family heard I was moving to Jacksonville, it was kind of the same reality. Like, really? 
Now you're in Texas and you're coming back to Florida? You know what? But at, by that point, they were just like, well, God bless you. You know, I'm not surprised. We knew it happened one day, right? Because you were so determined in your mind. I knew that I had to leave to be in God's will. Both to get in a good church, to be trained by a man of God, and then to be sent out by a man of God. And there are many people that would say, well, I want to be a pastor one day, but I'm in a little hick town of 100 people and I'm, I'm going to stay here and hopefully something happens. And No, it doesn't work that way. You need to go where a man of God is sending men out to great cities. You need to be willing to go to a Nineveh. You need to be willing to go to a, a Judah or a Moab. You need to be willing, steadfastly minded to go and say, hey, wherever God leads me, I will go. I want to be in His will. You think about how Abraham went when God sent him. And he was spiritually blessed. It says that Abraham, he was basically a great businessman. He probably had business connections. He probably had clients. He probably had deals going with different people. And what did he do? He forsook the fleshly and he sought after the spiritual. And God blessed that. There's many examples throughout the Old Testament of people that were needed to leave to get in God's will. Elisha, right? Great man of God. Twice as many miracles as Elijah. But how did his ministry start? He's working hard. He's at home, right? He's on the homestead. He's you know, got a good life there. And Elisha comes by. And he's like, I'm going with him. In fact, not only am I going with him, I'm going to make provision so I can't go back. I'm going to burn these instruments and these oxen, and I'm gone. I was, you know what I mean? You think about how he was blessed by all he, he went and served for several years. And then all of a sudden, God gave him twice as much power in the Holy Ghost, twice as much of a ministry, twice as many miracles, because he also was steadfastly minded to go. He said, I'm going to do it. I want to be in God's will. You think about how the disciples themselves, just as Jesus forsook His and went, then the disciples said, well, I'm forsaking all and I'm going to follow Jesus. And then one day, Jesus told them, go and do likewise. Yep. Right now, you need to go have your ministry. You need to go have your own disciples, your own cities. God used that for a reason. And we need to keep that in mind because I think, I think the devil lets us get you know, comfortable and things convenient and everything's in place. Why would I go? Things are perfect. Are they spiritually? Is there more you could do? Is there a city you need to be in where, where God wants you to be? And I believe a lot of you already, hey, you're in that city. You're in that, that place. But now that you're here, don't give up. Don't roll over. Don't get comfortable. Yeah. Right? You're in a fight. You're in, you think about sports games and how you know if you're on the if you're on the bench you're doing nothing. Yeah. They put you in. Guess what? You might get hit. Yeah. Guess what? You might score big, right? You might win the game, and that's what it's all about. When you're in the fight, you might win the battle. But if you're on the sideline, you're not even in the battle. You're not going to get any arrows shot at you. Life's going to be peachy. You're not going to do anything great for God so long as you're sitting home watching on YouTube. Right. And all, a lot of you already know this. You guys are in Genesis 45. Well, you know, Paul and Barnabas, another great one, right? They had an area. Well, God sent them out. God wanted them to go. And again, there's many places where, you know, you look back at Elimelech here where he moved for a job. And now we see the flip side where I, where I believe Ruth now is going for God. What was that spiritual price? She was willing to forsake everything for God. And that's the attitude we ought to have. Look at Genesis 45, verse 6. So in Genesis 45, just so you know, this is where we see Joseph. He's set up in charge. His brothers come. This is where he reveals himself. And as he's revealing himself, there's still a famine where his father is. So he wants them to come to him. Right? It was of God that they would come and grow even in Egypt. Look at verse 6. It says, For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest, right? Hey, a famine of the word. Think about this spiritually. You guys were all, hey, I was I was once in a place where there was a famine of the word. I went to Baptist church, Baptist church, and there was a famine of the word. We got a 30-minute motivational sermon, very little scripture. You go to the pastor with a real Bible question, and he's like, oh, his head starts spinning. Hey, pastor, will you teach me to be a better soul winner? Help me preach the gospel. Uh, come on, you know that's not what church is about. Today, it's it, the church is our thing. They're worthless. God's not pleased, and I was not spiritually satisfied until I said, "I'm going to go. I'm getting out of this famine." Right? There was a famine of the word. Look at verse seven. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, 
and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Think about the spiritual application again. Spiritual posterity. Will you, will you seek spiritual growth? Will you move for spiritual growth for the sake of your children? Think about it. If you have financial success and your children go work for the devil, that's a failure, right? If you live in utter poverty, but your kids grow up as soul winners that work for the Lord, God looks down at you and says, you are a great success. What's it worth to you to have children that are on fire for God? What's it worth to you to encourage the next generation to not be a bunch of dead beasts like we're surrounded with in our own generation? Spiritual posterity. The preserve of posterity. Save your lives from this great deliverance. You know, it's funny, I, I knew a family in Texas and they visited Steadfast several times and well, we got this brand new truck and daddy works for the oil fields and it's a long trip just to come to your church. We, got, we own a house, but we want to be in a good church. And it was when they made the decision, we're going at all, whatever the cost is. We're putting it on Craigslist and if it doesn't sell, then we're going to give it away tomorrow. And they did. They, he, he sold the truck. It was brand new. They sold all their TVs first. Praise the Lord, right? They sold the house. But you know, God's will was that I believe that they went to Arizona. They're in Arizona now growing and Lord willing, that man's son will grow up and be a great man of God one day. Amen. The son now is surrounded by men of God. He goes to the preaching class. He's a soul winner. He's on fire for God. I pray that that man grows up and leads a church one day. That he's an evangelist. That he's a missionary. Whatever God's will is, now he can do it. But back in deadbeat oil filled Texas, there's no spiritual growth. There's no posterity there for him. There was no spiritual future. And that's the biggest reason that people need to leave to go get that ministry God has for them. Look at verse number 8 here. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord over all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, my son Joseph, God hath made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. So he says, haste. He says, tarry not. He says, hurry up and go. Let my dad know that I am a father, a ruler, a Lord. Right? You notice how he uses those phrases together. He's saying, God has put me in a position of authority. And now he wasn't really Pharaoh's father, but it's just using that. He was the ruler. He's the Lord over Egypt. God used it where they tried to kill him. They tried to sell him into slavery. And God said, no, you're going to be a ruler. You're going to be a Lord because your heart is right with me. And but he tells them, hurry up and go. And hey, don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait and see if the famine's going to over. You, know, you need to get out of the city where it's dead and you need to get in a church that's on fire. Look at verse number 10. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, and I, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. Again, spiritually speaking, looking at this. If you are suffering from spiritual poverty and you want your children to be nourished, in fact, you want it to be said, I don't even have grandchildren yet, but I want them serving God also, yeah. then you got to go. you got to move. You got to get up off your butt and do something for God. You got to be willing to sacrifice for the sake of the future of the children. Take them to a church where they'll be nourished. Look at verse 17. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye. Laid your beasts, and go get you into the land of Canaan, and take your father and your household, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now, Thou art commanded, this do ye, take your wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Listen, for the sake of your children, get in a good church. Set a date. Make it happen. You guys are already here. Stay on fire. Set goals. Say, I want to memorize. I want to learn. I want to learn more songs. I want to be able to preach. I want to let God use me in any way that He'll use me. I want to get here early and serve in the church. Whatever it is. Whatever it is you're not doing, be willing to sacrifice to be used of God. God has more for every one of us. There are things all of us can grow in. But we have to be willing to sacrifice a little. But you know, here he says, for your little ones, for your wives. You know how wives are so important? You know, it's funny because my dad used to joke. 
about how you can tell how conservative a man was by how conservative his wife dresses. And he would yeah. make fun of the nuns and the Amish and the Muslims, right? And if you ever see these people in public, it's like they're wearing jeans and a t-shirt and their wife is covered from head to toe. And it's like, that's my religion, right? They're, they're demonstrating their religion. Women need support. In our movement, we love women. We love the freedom that God has in the Bible. It's not about being a tyrannical overseer. It's about demonstrating love and dwelling according to knowledge. And your women need other women that are like-minded. Yeah. When a woman decides she's going to take a stand and she's going to dress differently, she's not going to expose parts of her body to anybody and everybody. She needs other women to help teach her. Yeah. When a woman says, I'm going to stay at home and I'm going to deal with difficult children and I'm going to teach them things, they need other women to help them. Yeah. And here he's saying, for the sake of your little ones, for the sake of your women, go. Move. Get moving. You think about that. This is very important in our movement. This is so important. Yeah. And it's funny because a guy that visited with us two weeks ago, well, my wife really wants to go. And I'm telling him, man, you should be a preacher. Yeah, I know, I want to be. You want to be a preacher. You want to serve God. And your wife's the one that's on fire to go. Why? Not so she can be a preacher. So she can be among like-minded women. So she can be encouraged and be an encouragement. We all have different talents. We all have different abilities. We all have different amounts of wisdom that God wants to bring us together. And the women are so important for your little ones and your wives. Let's not forget that. Let's not forget that. It's super important. And look what he says in verse 20. This is so cool. Also, regard not your stuff, for the good of the land of Egypt is yours. Hey, don't worry about what you have to leave behind. If you have to leave a brand new TV on the curb so you can get in a good church, praise the Lord, right? But even if it's a dresser or a bed, we gave away couches and all sorts of stuff. Like, we're getting out of here, right? We got to go. This is important. This is more important than stuff. Stuff is easy to come by. Right. Stuff is so easy to come by. We don't live for stuff. Right. We live for souls, for winning souls, for serving people, and serving God. Don't also regard not your stuff. In retrospect in life, how many times has something, some stuff, got in between people? And this is why, you know, being a, being a computer guy with equipment, we've had, in Fort Worth, we had a guy one time, he plugged the wrong thing in the wrong thing and fried it, 300 bucks like that. Whoa. And he expected my reaction to be, but you know what it was? It's okay. It's just stuff. It's just stuff. God can replace it, and He did. It's no big deal. Rather than Him, oh, no, what about it? It's okay. Maybe I didn't do well enough in training you, in teaching you how to handle the equipment. That's my fault. right? But the flesh wants to say, how dare you? You better get your daddy and his checkbook over here right now. Right? Now if I acted like that, that young man might just be offended by the ministry and go off instead, hey, he's in preaching class. Right? He's learning to preach. Amen. He's growing. And we need to be patient with each other. We need to remember stuff doesn't matter. Your wife breaks something, burns something. Hey, whatever. That's cool. Don't worry about it, baby. God will replace it. She wrecks your car. Hey, it's all right. Are you okay? It's just stuff. It doesn't matter. We need to keep this mentality. And look, that's what they're saying. It's just stuff. If you have to leave a house full of stuff to save the souls of your very children, is it worth it? Is it worth it? You better believe it is. And that's the attitude we have to... I mean, give it away. Don't be a loser over a bunch of junk. A bunch of stinking junk. And there's so many people caught up in that. We need to, you need to set a date and go just as much as we that are here need to set goals and stay on target. We need to set goals and stay on target. We need to trust God to provide that He'll get us there and provide everything we need. And just as much as whether it's whether you're, you don't have children, you're, hey, well, God, I'm trusting you to provide children. If you have an attitude of, Lord, oh no, are we done? Is this it? No more children or no children at all? Your attitude needs to be, I trust 100%. If God wants to give me children, He'll do it. If you don't have a wife, you don't have a husband, in the same way you have to have that attitude, I trust God 100% to provide. I personally did that. I, for years I said, I'm moving to, stead, to, to Faithful Word after I get a wife. After I get a job, I can transfer to Arizona. And it wasn't until I finally said, I don't care anymore about the stuff. I'm going to serve my God. I want to be a better soul winner. I want to be on fire for God. I want to be used in the ministry. Then guess what? God provided me a wife and children and a great job and all those other things. His Word is true. 
Would you suffer in the flesh a little bit to, to be able to be used of God? And a lot of people are hesitant. Well, I don't have the skill set. I don't have the, the, the money. I don't have the resources to go to, to one of these, these places, right? One of these great churches. But listen, no skill, no problem, unless you have no faith, right? If you're willing to change your lifestyle, if you're willing to take a step down in life just so you can grow spiritually, God will bless that. Yeah. God will provide. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe you need to go to welding school at night. So you can get a job in Arizona or in California or in Texas or in Florida or wherever God's moving you to go. And I believe that's God's will is that you would grow. Look, look at verse 21 here. And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way. Like I said, once you go, you're going to be under attack. There'll be fiery darts from the devil. You're not on the sideline anymore, but that doesn't mean... You're, everybody's going to have problems. Some people, the biggest battle is just saying, I will go. And then everything's smooth sailing. Other people, the battle is the moment they pull their car out of the driveway. Flat tire. Fix it. Get down the road. Engine problem. You know what I mean? One thing after another. Some people have had those issues. And you know, those people that finally make it, they're steadfast. They're in it. They're in it to win it. And we have to have that same attitude. Look at verse 24. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. Right? It may not be easy, but we got to stay in the fight. Now that you're here, don't fall out of church. Don't fall out of serving God. <coughs> Those that you talk to that have told you they want to move here, tell them not to fall out during the way. Where were you guys at? What happened? We got a flat tire. We went home. What? I thought you burned that bridge. Well, we kept the lease open. Well, then you had you were not determined already. You hadn't already made that decision. Otherwise, you would. And I've seen a lot of people come and go, and I've seen a lot of people say they're going to come, but never go, and they never took that first step. I've seen a lot of people that said, I will go, and they have, and they're, they're growing. They're on fire for the Lord. They're winning souls. And one day they may be sent out as a pastor, as, a, as an evangelist. And that's ultimately the goal is we need to make these decisions to get in the battle and not turn back. Yeah. We know God's going to provide and we have to make sure it's up to us not to fall out on the way. That's the warning here. See that you fall not out. He's, he knew. like You got everything you need. Just don't fall out. Yeah. Couldn't you imagine what if they just stopped? They're on their way to salvation and they just stop and we're going to camp over here for a little bit. We're going to pull our RV up and there's this little Bible Baptist church we're going to go to. They're a little Calvinistic, but the music's good. <laughs> and then you don't get in the will of God. Wouldn't that be lame? Yeah. You think about what he's saying here. Make your decision. Set a date. Set a goal. Make it happen at all costs. Yeah. Act as if that goal is life or death. Right? Ruth had that attitude. <laughs> Do so and more unto me, she says. God should do so more and more unto me if I don't go. If, the, if, death, if, if only death would separate us. She's saying, I'm with you for the rest of your life. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going with you. I want your God. And that's the attitude we have to have as Christians. Look at the next chapter here in verse, verse uh, chapter 46, verse 3. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt. For I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Now turn back to Ruth chapter 1. I really like that part of that because it hits home for me because I left Florida to go to Texas. I wanted to be a better Christian. I wanted to be a better soul winner. I was praying the Lord would use me one day to help lead a church, to be a pastor one day. I have goals. I know what God can do, and I want to be used of God. And God, to whatever extent you want to use me, I'll go. I'll leave Florida. I'm going to Texas. And then guess what? Just like with this, he says, God went with me. God blessed him, made him a nation, and brought him back. I went to Texas single. God gave me an awesome wife, a beautiful daughter, another child on the way. And here he's brought me back to Florida. It shouldn't be a surprise when a guy left Florida and God brought me back to Florida. I shouldn't be surprised. Shouldn't be overwhelmed. I shouldn't have doubted those times. Oh, is it really going to work out? I don't know how the budget's going to work. How's my? I should have just. You know what? 
I trust the Lord. You need to add this phrase to your prayer. Lord, I'm trusting You. Right? You know you're praying for something. Lord, I'm trusting You for an answer. Lord, I'm trusting You for provision. Lord, I'm trusting You for growth. You need to tell Him you're trusting Him and then show it in your actions. Live it out. And I, I love that fact because He sent me out, helped me increase, and then sent me back when the time was right. And I believe God will do the same thing for a lot of men. I mean, I, I honestly, I had a goal of one day I either want to go to Jacksonville, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, or Houston, Texas to start a church. Those were the three places that I had on my list, my top three. Oh, well, Jacksonville's off the list. That won't happen, right? So my goal was, okay, Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. That's my focus. And maybe Houston, but primarily Atlanta. I still have a heart for Atlanta. They need something, right? That'd be a great church if there was one there. But Jacksonville kind of got put in the background till one day I got that call from the Lord. Actually, it was the call from Pastor Romero, right? <laughs> the calling to preach. And I thank God for it. He used me. And I think about some of the men here. Brother Marcel, you moved up from South Florida. I want to see God send you back to South Florida to start a church. Brother Joe, you moved from New Jersey. I want to see God send you back to New York or New Jersey to start an awesome church for God. That would be success for this church. There are many men in here I believe the Lord can use to go out and start ministries. And if you say, well, I'm not qualified or I'm not there or I'm not married, don't take that attitude. You say, whatever God will do with me, I want to go do it. Whatever aspect that is. If that just means going to be an assistant, don't going to be a helper. Take the attitude, Lord, if you want me to move, I'll move. Lord, if you want me to get closer, I'll get closer. Whatever it is, have that attitude. Be steadfastly minded to go. I want, I want to see Brother Luke go out and start a church one day. Wherever the Lord would lead him. Wherever. We need to have this attitude in our heart. We have to be willing. They have to be willing to move. Look at Ruth. Verse 19. So they too went until they came unto Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. She was being honest, right? She's not bad-mouthing God. She said, I believe she said, Hey, this is the fruit of disobeying God. This is the fruit of getting out of God's will. And yet, through it all, let's keep in mind, she's coming back with someone that was searching God. Right? Those people that ask those hypotheticals, what about that guy out in Africa that has no, you know? Which, by the way, I, I used to do a website for this guy that was a missionary to Africa. And I asked him, I said, well, let me ask you this, your city. Where, and he showed me on the map, and I'm like, okay, now how far? He's like three hours from the main city, and I mean, it was a major ordeal just to get anywhere. And I said, so growing up, did you hear about Jesus? And he just starts laughing. This is in Liberia, is where he was. And he said, Brother Adam! He's like, there's two Baptist churches, there's a Catholic mission, there's Mennonites out there, out in the woods, out nowhere, right? And sometimes in America, we take things for granted. We just say, well, we've got a church on every corner, we're the only ones like that. I believe if you're searching for God with your heart, if you believe, right, if you're diligently seeking, and you believe He will reward you for seeking, you will find Him. Amen. What if Ruth had that attitude? I want to know the one true God of the Bible. I'm looking for God. And through Elimelech's mistake of disobeying God, Elimelech lost his life and his sons. But yet, here comes Naomi back with a young lady that wanted to be saved. How many times have you guys as soul winners, oh, I was just saying last night, I wish I knew. I was just praying that God would help me figure this out. And then here you are. That happens so many times out soul winning because we ask God to send us to those that are searching. And remember that. There may be people in a Moab that need to be pulled out to get on fire for the Lord. You may find somebody at a door one day that wants to be as on fire as you for soul winning. Don't take it for granted just because they're in a different life. Maybe they've been looking for something worth living for their whole life. And we can show them that. Look at verse 20. Verse 21. And I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home empty. Why then call you me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning 
of barley harvest. Again, Ruth sought the Lord despite Naomi being afflicted by the Lord. I think that's an amazing fact that a lot of people overlook in this story. She sees Naomi saying, I'm being cursed, I'm being afflicted, the Lord's hand is on me. And she's saying, yeah, but God's real. And this is evidence He's real. Look what He's doing to you. I know you know where He's at. I want to get saved. Show me where He's at. And I bet you Naomi was a soul winner. I bet you despite everything else, she was still telling about God. She was still preaching of God. Because you notice, Oprah, Orpah, went back to her false gods, but, they, but, but Ruth did not. And she would rather, think about it, you know, for somebody to say, I'd rather live for a God that will correct me on the earth than to die and go to hell. That's a, that's a serious attitude. Hey, I would rather have a parent that loved me enough to spank me and tell me when I'm wrong than to just let me do whatever I want because they don't care, because they don't love me. Are you willing to leave your comfort zone to get in the will of God? Even now that you're here, don't find a comfort zone. Don't find a lazy area. Are you willing to leave that comfort zone and get in the will of God more and more, day by day? If you died today, looking back with everything good and bad you've done, and you stand before God at the judgment seat, will you be satisfied? Seriously, if you died today right now, would you be satisfied standing before the Lord saying, I did everything I could? Or are you too worried about work? Are you too worried about life? Too worried about finances? Hey, I know those things are important. Those are responsibilities. Training children is a responsibility that takes away from your time of reading the Bible. I understand that. But we have to figure it out and balance it out. And that's how we'll be spiritually blessed. That's how we'll be rewarded with opportunities. Many people are not even in the race. Did you finish your race? Oh, I'm not even in the race. Wouldn't that be sad? Yeah. God say, I had something right around the corner for you, but you went down to Best Buy for that TV sale. <laughs> right? I'm after that stuff. Oh, i got to go get the stuff. Forget the stuff, man. Forget the friends and the family that want to pull you down and keep you right. back. Come on, stay with us in Moab. No. Nope. I'm going to Judah. Right? I am steadfastly minded to go get in the will of the Lord. In Matthew 9, he says, Then said he unto the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that He will send forth laborers into His harvest. I am praying that God will send more people to this church but I am more importantly praying for those that are here that you would be steadfastly minded to grow. Let's pray. Father God, I love You. Lord, I love Your Word. I love the stories in the Bible that we can learn from, that You teach us through. Lord, I just pray that You would continue to fill the people in our church with Your Holy Spirit. Lord, help them to be better preachers, better Christians, better soul winners. Lord, I pray that You would send up men and send them out of here. I pray that You would use this church to start other churches one day. Lord, I pray for Atlanta, Georgia, that You would start a church there. Lord, I have a burden for it in my heart, but I believe You'll answer that call. You'll send somebody. There are many people there that would love to serve You. Lord, I pray that You would send these men out and just use them for You. Thank You for using me. Thank You, Jesus. Amen.